of God, or, or what we maybe think of as like pagans or heathens, and says, okay, those people are under, under sin and under God's wrath. And then he turns, and as soon as you start nodding your head and saying, yeah, they deserve God's wrath, then he turns to us as religious people, and he says, you also, those of you who, who could nod and say, yeah, they're sinners, you're just as much a sinner, because we do the things that we um, condemn others for doing. Our hearts are just as sinful as those people outside of our religion or outside of our faith. So he turns both to the irreligious as well as to the religious. He says, all of us are condemned and deserve God's wrath, which is where he brings us by about the midpoint of chapter 3. And then there's that incredible passage where he says, but now another path to the righteousness of God has been revealed. From faith to faith, that God has shown us a path to righteousness not by our works, not by what we do, but by faith in what Jesus Christ has done. And he says Jesus is the redemption as in the propitiation for us. Redemption means that he's paid the price for us, and propitiation means that he has stood in as our substitute. He has taken the wrath that we deserve. So then that finishes chapter 3, and in chapter 4, he reminds us that, that we, we are saved by faith and not by works. He looks at Abraham and he says, was Abraham saved because of what he did or because of what he believed? And he talks through that, that it is faith that makes us right with God in chapter 4. So we've kind of got all the way through the gospel. We've talked about the need for the gospel. We've talked about uh, what the gospel is, that Jesus Christ has paid the price for us and that we have to accept that by faith. And if I were writing Romans, I would probably, okay, Romans chapter 4, we've, we've dealt with the gospel. Now it's time to move on to other parts of Christian doctrine and other teachings. You look at Romans chapter 5, and let's just look at these first 11 verses together. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So Paul finishes up the gospel in four chapters, and what does he go into? He goes right back into the gospel again. Kind of one of the things, one of the reasons we're looking at Romans um, is we want to renew our focus on the gospel. We want to remind ourselves that we don't grow out of the gospel, we don't go past the gospel. The gospel is always where we come back to, it's always where we grow out of. Let's I just want to kind of show you how he does that. So the first part there, since we have been justified by faith. He kind of bases on all that we've talked about in the first four chapters. We know now that we've been justified. We've, we've been declared righteous, and it's been by faith. What do we have because we've been justified? This is a, a great reminder. Do you know what you have in Jesus Christ? Do you know what you have in your salvation? I think sometimes that's why we think we need to move past the gospel, because our understanding of it is so shallow that, that we just kind of think, well, good. Uh, when I die, I'm not going to go to hell. Instead, I've got a ticket to heaven. And that's what the gospel gives me, is just sometime in the future, if I die, it's going to be okay. That's the, that's the basis of what the gospel is good for. And yet, Paul's going to remind us that what we have in the gospel is so much more than that. The very first thing he says there, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
We have peace with God, which is the whole solution of what we've been talking about. Because of our sin, we stand deserving God's wrath, deserving God to punish us. And because God has justified us through faith, we now stand in a, in a state of having peace with God. I think it's, is it chapter 8 that begins... Chapter 8, 1, similar to 5, 1. 5, 1, it says, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 8, 1, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is an incredible promise. We never have to fear the wrath of God. Now, that's not to say you never have to fear the discipline of God. There's, there are two very different things. Hebrews reminds us that God disciplines those he loves. And so if you don't, aren't disciplined by God, if you don't see God correcting you and, and bringing some of the consequences of your sin into your life to get you to change directions, then the author of Hebrews says that's a scary place to be. You want to be disciplined by God because that means you're his child and he loves you and is looking out for you. But because we have peace with God, we can anticipate being disciplined by God, but we never have to fear the wrath of God coming on us. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We stand completely before God with a clean slate. We stand righteous before God, never having to answer and pay the wrath of God for our sins. But that's not all we have in Christ. That's not all we have in, in the gospel. Verse 2, it says, Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. I kind of think it like, of it like a judge standing before a defendant, and somehow someone comes in and takes the punishment that this defendant rightly deserves. And so the judge knows that this defendant is guilty, but is getting off because someone else has taken the punishment. And you'd imagine the judge kind of saying, Okay, fine. You can go. You're free. The law has no more stand over you. But get out of my courtroom. I never want to see you again. You, you kind of anticipate the judge grudgingly giving this clemency. Grudgingly giving forgiveness. And yet the, the truth of the gospel is we not only have peace with God through Jesus Christ. It's not only that God has forgiven us, but God also likes us. We stand in his grace. We're given permission, we're given access, Paul says, to come in and stand in his grace. What does that mean? Two words I want you to write down there underneath. We enjoy God's favor and we enjoy God's blessing. Because of Jesus Christ in the gospel, because of what God has done for us through Christ, because we have been justified by faith, we don't just have a ticket to heaven at the end of our lives. Here and now, we enjoy access to stand in the grace of God. That God looks on us in Christ. He looks on us with favor. He looks on us with his blessing. He looks on us and we make him smile. This is a message that somehow so often gets lost that, that there's a God who as we preach about our sin and as we preach about God's wrath there's this message that even Christians sense that, that there's this God who's really kind of just angry with them all the time looking for something they're doing wrong and looking for something where, where they've offended him again and yet it's not the message that we get in scripture it's not the message that God has given to us that that he's this angry, grumpy grandfather hoping we keep it down down here so he can enjoy a good nap. He is a God who looks on us and doesn't see you in your sin. He sees you covered in his son. And there's nothing he loves more than his son. So when he looks on you, you stand in his grace. You stand under Jesus Christ. You stand in his favor. You stand in his blessing and it doesn't even stop there not only are we forgiven and have peace with God and not only does God now like us and and favor us and shower us with his goodness and grace 
But then jump down to verse 5. We'll get verses 3 and 4 in a second. Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Not only do we have access to stand in God's grace, but we also have God's love has been poured into our hearts. In the gospel, the message of the gospel is that we have peace with God, that we stand in God's grace, and that God's love has been poured into our hearts. And, and specifically, how do we know that God's love has been poured into our hearts? Through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The Holy Spirit within us is, a, is an evidence, is a proof that God's love is poured all over you. We talked, um, I think it was back around Christmas time, about the love of God. And often when we talk about the love of God, we, we think it means something about us. God loves me. And so that makes me feel good because that must mean I'm pretty good. That must mean there's something lovable about me. That must mean I'm desirable. And usually when humans talk to each other and when we tell each other we love you or you love me, it, it makes me feel good about myself because your love for me indicates that there's something love worthy in me. But God's love is different. God does not love you because you are lovely, lovable, and desirable. If it were based on us, God's love would, would wane a lot more than it would wax. Is that the right word, way to use those words? It would, it would get less and less. God's love is not based on your characteristics and your qualities. God's love is based on who he is. And while that may feel like it takes something away from it, like it, it feels less special to be loved by God if it doesn't have, is it based on me? What, what the impressive side of that is, is that God's love is a giving, sacrificial love. Paul talks about husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. God's love gives. God's love sacrifices. The whole idea of love is not you're worthy of this much or you're, you've done this much for me, but it is I am love and because I am love, I'm going to pour it onto you. Unattached to who you are and what you do and how much you deserve it today. So when you mess up and you walk away from God, naturally our human response is, man, God must love me less today than he did last year when I was having such close walk with him and when I was in obedience and when I was doing everything right. And yet that's a human perspective of God's love growing when we do good and shrinking when we do bad. But God's love is based on who he is and he gives it to us because of who he is. He is always working for our good, which goes back to discipline again. It doesn't mean that he's not going to discipline us. It means that he will discipline us because he loves us. He will always work for your good. Can you just, I know you've heard all this before. And as I'm, as I'm talking, it, you know, I'm kind of talking to a room and it's like, yep, got it. We have heard this message before. And, and I would probably be the same if I were sitting in your chair. But just think for a second that the almighty God, the creator of everything, knows you cares about you and is working for your good. That everything that happens to you, that an almighty God is going to make sure that it comes out for your good. That is an amazing hope. That is an amazing confidence that we have. That should radically change our lives. That someone's got my back. No matter what you do to me, no matter how much you want to get me, I've got someone greater, bigger, stronger, and more powerful than you are who is going to take care of me and work your evil into my good. Isn't that what Joseph told his brothers? Yeah, you, you meant it for evil. But I've got someone who loves me who's bigger than you and who's stronger than you and took what you meant for evil and he worked it for my good and even for your good. That's what the gospel says to us. That's what the gospel gives to us. That God is in us and we are in him. It does not get any more intimate than that. Uh, 
Paul says, we know God loves us because the Holy Spirit dwells within us. Our relationship with God is not that he's way up there and we're down here. A Christian's relationship with his God is absolutely intimate. Paul goes so far as to compare the church's relationship with Christ to a husband's relationship with his wife, even sexually, the relationship that they have with each other. Even the intimacy of sex and how we, our bodies are combined. Paul says even that is a picture of how close and how intimate God is with his people. God is in us and we are in him. So any image of this distant old grandfather who, who kind of wants good for us but is disconnected from us is absolutely foreign to the gospel. Jesus Christ brought, shattered that, that image. Jesus Christ brings God here among us, Emmanuel with us. So how does that change our lives? What do we do because of that? There's three responses then. Three times uh, in my Bible as I read through there, it says rejoice, we rejoice, we rejoice. And so I was, you know, putting this sermon together and, okay, this is what we have in God, one, two, three, and this is what we do, we rejoice, one, two, three. I thought, wow, that's a, that's a sermon just waiting to be preached. That's perfect. And it's, it's amazing. Um, I was working through there, and then I happened to read the same verses in another translation, which is not a bad idea to grab another translation because I grabbed the new NIV. There's two NIVs. I don't know if you know. There's like the pre-84 NIV, and then there's the updated 84 NIV. I grabbed the new NIV version and read it, and it doesn't say rejoice. Anybody have a, a new NIV? You probably don't know if it's a new one or an old one. If it says rejoice, it's an old one. If it says something else, uh, so verse 2 says, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. But the new NIV, NIV says, we boast in hope of the glory of God. Um, verse 3, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Again, NIV says, we boast in our sufferings. And then you go down to verse 11. Not more than that, we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So then I, I started looking at the different translations. The New American, I think it says, we exalt. It says exalt all three times. We exalt in God. We exalt in the hope. We exalt in sufferings. I think and New King James Version and King James Version kind of do a combination of we rejoice and we glory in them. Um, and really this word is a, is a difficult one to translate in this context because guess what the Greek word actually says? We boast in God. The NIV got it absolutely right. But I think these other translations, including the ESV, were kind of like, ugh. Boast is not a good thing to write. So let's kind of soften it or change it. Not, I'm not. How do we boast in a good way? What's a word that, that describes boasting in a good way or exalting in a good way? And so ESV chose rejoice and New American chose exalt. Um, this is a cool thing. I, I send my notes to Judy, um, and she puts them into German. And so I had, the, I, I had, therefore we rejoice, we boast, we glory, or we exalt. And she sent it back to me, and she had these German words. We rühmen, verherrlichen, or jubeln. And I thought, jubeln, that's, that's a great word to kind of sum it all up. Jubeln, uh, uh, the, the English word I would pick to, to translate jubeln would be to celebrate. We, we celebrate something. And, and celebrate, I think, if, if I were doing a Bible translation, is probably the word I would pick. Uh, because it's not just rejoice. There's a word for rejoice that Paul uses later in Romans that means rejoice. And that he uses, you know, Philippians, there's this rejoice over and over. And he purposely doesn't use that word. And boast seems, especially in the English language, to be such a proud thing. It, we never use the word boast in a positive way. And so it's hard to, to say we should boast. But when you celebrate, you're basically kind of bragging about what's happened to you. You're, you're happy about what's happen, happened to you. You're letting everyone know 
what has happened to you. So we ought to celebrate as Christians. There ought to be rejoicing. We ought to exalt. We ought to glory. And, and we ought to boast in the sense that we are so excited about what has happened to us that people ought to know it. We ought to be people who celebrate and who the people around us know what we celebrate. But, but I think the, the last verse helps us even as we think about that. What should we be celebrating? What should we be boasting and glorying and rejoicing in? Verse 11, more than that, more than all of that, we also, we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. We as Christians ought to be people who celebrate our God, who celebrate God. Last Sunday, um, I, I mentioned that our, uh, some friends of mine, way back from my high school friends, their, her, his parents were here. And after the song service, they came up to me and they're like, you were raising your hands in worship, I can't believe it. Because we come from a very, both I and my parents and also uh, these friends come from a more conservative, old, I was gonna say old fashioned, that might be, traditional is the word I'm looking for. A traditional heritage. And I appreciate that, I respect that. Uh, but people don't raise their hands. And what caught my ears, they're from the Philadelphia area. And the husband said, you know what, if we can celebrate the Eagles, and trust me, all of Philadelphia celebrated the Eagles. If we can celebrate the Eagles, we ought to be able to celebrate God as well. We ought to get excited about who our God is. People ought to hear and see and know that we rejoice in our God that we glory in our God, that we are proud of who our God is. We ought to celebrate in God, but not in ourselves. Somehow, so often when we begin to celebrate, it becomes little about God and a lot about us. It becomes about our brand or our denomination or our church instead of our God. And God ought to be the one that we exalt. God ought to be the one that we tell people about, that we're proud of, that we glory in, and that we celebrate. And then you think about the glory of God, how amazing he is. And, and then that takes you up uh, to verse 2. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice, we celebrate, we boast in hope of the glory of God. We celebrate in hope of the glory of God. Uh, the New Living Translation put it this way, we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. Is that true of you? We live in a world that is broken. There's reminder after reminder after reminder on the national level, on the community level, on the family level, on an individual level, that, that we live in a broken world, in a sinful world, in a fallen world. We see ourselves doing things we never thought we would do. We see our community, we see our nation, we see the world. And, and we live in that so often, that I think sometimes we lose this hope that God has given us. And the hope is, of the glory of God. Not just that he has the glory of God, but that we will one day share the glory of God. That we can confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing in God's glory. That the brokenness inside of us one day will be healed. That the brokenness in the world around us one day will be healed. And we will enjoy not just seeing God in his glory, but sharing the glory of God. We will enjoy being made whole again. We will enjoy from the deepest part of us to the outside of us, our will and our heart and our life lining up with God. Paul says that ought to be something that we celebrate as believers. It ought to be something that we glory in and exalt and look forward to the hope of sharing in God's glory. 
So, so you look in the past and you say, I can glory in who God is and I can look in the future and I can glory in where he's taking us. But Paul doesn't leave us just glorying and celebrating the past or the future. Paul then takes it all the way to the middle, to where you are right now. He says, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And then look at verse 3. Not only that, but we rejoice. Remember, this word rejoice is we glory, we boast, we exalt, we celebrate. And what does he say in verse 3 that we glory and boast and exalt and celebrate? Come on. In our sufferings, in our tribulations. Paul says as Christians, we don't just hope in the future that one day God's going to make it okay and one day God's going to heal me and us and the world and one day something great's going to happen. But that hope comes right down to the present, comes down to here and now. That no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're experiencing, that we celebrate our sufferings, that we celebrate in our suffering. How can we celebrate in suffering? Just all your heads go down to write the notes. I'm going to let you write those four words. But then I want you to look at, look at verses 3, 4, and 5. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope. And our hope does not put us to shame. In Christ, in the gospel, we have a hope that is stronger than any suffering we go through. Do you believe that? Do you, do you see that by faith? Do you understand that? That the hope we have in the gospel is greater than the suffering we go through in the world. So Paul says, even in our sufferings, we boast, we celebrate, we rejoice. Because sufferings produce endurance. They strengthen and make us tough. And endurance produces character, and character brings out our hope. Character pushes us to hope in the love of God. Our hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And then it's like he kind of says, uh, so what? What does the love of God do for you? So he starts to talk about exactly what God's look, love looks like. While we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. One will scarcely die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still Sinners Christ died for us. Since we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved from, by him from the wrath of God. For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. He's used four words to describe you and me. Did you see that? We were weak. We were ungodly. We were sinners. We were enemies. Weak, ungodly, sinful enemies. How many of you love people like that? Our human love does not reach out to that. Human love does not say, where are weak, ungodly, sinful enemies of mine so that I can go pour my love onto them? Which goes back to what I was saying about God's love. God's love isn't because of who you are. It's not because of how good you look, how funny you are, what a great friend you are because you're always there for me. All these things that we talk about with I love you because of this and I love you because of that. None of that is going for us with God. We were weak. We had no energy to, to approach God or to engage God. We were ungodly. We were the opposite of God. We were sinful. And we were God's what? We were God's enemies. That is the condition that God found us in. That is the condition that God loved us in. And it seems like what Paul's point is, 
is no matter what we go through, we ought to have a hope and a confidence of saying, my God has got this. I've already seen God take the most hopeless situation I could ever imagine and turn it into hope. I've already seen God overcome my weakness, my sin, my ungodliness, and my enmity against him. And he turned it around and he made it good. He redeemed me and he rescued me in hopeless situation. So every situation I come to after that, I come to it and I say, God's already done something bigger and greater than this. God's already redeemed me from a worse situation than this. I've been in worse situation and God has saved me once. God can save me again. I hate this following illustration. I wish I could think of any other illustration. I'm a Buffalo Bills fan. Buffalo Bills are in the AFC East. And there's this other team in the AFC East. We've not been in the playoffs until this year for 18 years. M largely to do because of this other stinking team in the AFC East. And for like a jillion years, this other team in the AFC East has this one quarterback named Tom Brady. Beautiful Tom Brady. And what Tom Brady does is no matter how bad things get, he jogs out onto the field, he goes into the huddle, and, and what do you inevitably know is going to happen? Tom Brady is going to lead his team back to victory. Except this year. Amen. But you can almost see what, what Paul is telling Christians to have, this this celebrating even in our sufferings, you can almost see it in the Patriots team and you can hear it in their, in their beautiful fans, Johnny. They get behind and when my team gets behind, I start looking for snacks, I start looking for other shows to watch. But when the Patriots get behind, you know, they're like, oh, here it comes, we're about to come back because we've got Tom Brady. And we know what Tom Brady has done in the past. So even when things get bad and you're down by 28 points in the Super Bowl, you know, there's just this confidence of, yeah, it's no big deal. Tom's got this. We're going to pull out the win. And as much as I hate it in football, I really think that's the way Christians are supposed to go through life. That we ought to have such confidence in our God and what he has done for us. That when things get bad, we ought to have this, forgive me, this cockiness. Yeah, it's pretty bad, but my God's got this. My God has saved me from worse than this in the past. I have seen my God jog onto the field in just such a hopeless situation and turn it around. So I don't care what the scoreboard says. I don't care how far back we are. I don't care how bad things are in my life right now. I know that I know that I know that my God can redeem this, that my God can turn this around because my God loves me. I have the creator of the world that cares about me and my life. And he has shown me in the past and he has shown me time and time again in his word that he will work even the suffering I go through out for my good. That's what he does. That's what he has promised to do. And so I rejoice, I celebrate, and I boast, and I glory even in my sufferings because I have a God who loves me. And because he loves me, I know that he will take care of me. I know that this is going to work out. I know that he will turn this around. Do you have that hope? It is ours in the gospel. That God, that we have peace with God. So we never have to fear his wrath. We have, we stand in his grace. And so we don't have to worry that he doesn't like us and he's angry at us and we're bothering him. His favor and blessing is on us. And his love has been poured into our hearts. So there ought to be a celebration that runs through our lives. 
the hope that we have in the future, but also the hope that you have today with whatever is going on in your life. In, in the worst of our sufferings, and, and that's kind of what's ironic, that scripture is written to people who, who were suffering in ways that we don't even understand. We have a lot of first world problems that, that shake our faith and rock our worlds. And this promise was written to people with life and death problems, life and death suffering, saying even in that suffering, you can hold on to faith. Would you pray with me?